Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Getting to another round of questions today. I want to mention Ephesians chapter 2, which is such a beautiful chapter. It will go along with some things we're going to study today, and it also goes along with many of the things that we are studying right now in Galatians. And when you serve Jesus Christ, when you accept Him as your Savior, and you serve Him, you study God's Word, you do your best to be pleasing to the Father, you have that access. And what a truly beautiful thing that is. And so let's go ahead and get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yeah, but Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and this place you've given us. We can teach your word. We, can, we ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In the Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the precious name. Amen. I also mentioned that you can read about access as well in Ephesians chapter 3 and I believe Romans chapter 5. Some very beautiful scriptures there. Okay, let's get into the questions. Scott, we don't know where Scott's from. I have a question about Enoch. It says in Genesis 5 that he's the sixth from Adam, but it says in Jude chapter 1 verse 14 that he's the seventh from Adam. Can you help unfold this prophecy? And no, he's the seventh from Adam in both places, but I, I can understand your mindset because um, you have to count Adam as one. And so you got Adam, and then, then you got Seth, and then uh, I think the next one's Enos, Mahaliel, Jared, and I think I'm in Canaan. I think I might have got those in the wrong order. But going all the way, then Enoch is the seventh. But you got to count Adam as number one. And um, you also see that in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, very, could not be more clear. And so what's cool about that, for one thing, as well as others, I mean, that lets you know that's the exact Enoch that it's talking about, is the one that's the seventh from Adam. Of course, you know, there was also a Kenite named Enoch. Eden from Missouri. Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 16, Joseph's father is Jacob. According to Luke, Joseph's father is Heli. Joseph had just two biological fathers, and no. So Matthew chapter 1, that is the genealogy of Joseph, Mary's husband. But of course, that has nothing to do with the seed line of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was only Joseph's son by adoption. You know that Mary was a virgin. When she gave birth to Jesus Christ. So what do you see in Luke chapter 3 verse 23? It says that Jesus Christ as was supposed is the, the son of Joseph who is the son of Heli. So what's that talking about as was supposed? Luke chapter 3 is actually the genealogy of Mary. Mary is the one who is the, the daughter of Heli. So, so that is the actual genealogy of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in Luke chapter 3. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 is just the genealogy of Joseph, which has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ. Melissa, we don't know where Melissa's from. Was wondering if you could tell me in Ezekiel, I think, where it is documented pertaining to the millennial temple that the elect is separated, 7,000 to be with Yeshua, the rest elsewhere. Where is this written? And you're thinking of Ezekiel 44, and we're going to go there and read a little bit of it, because I want to clarify, and for, for someone that had never read these millennium chapters, they might think that that means, how you put it, that the elect are just in a separate place, completely away from everyone the entire thousand years. Well, that, that's not how it is. You know that the, the elect will be teachers throughout that thousand year teaching period. We're going to go to Ezekiel 44. Ezekiel chapters 40 through 48 are all about that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. That begins when the true Christ, when Jesus Christ returns to earth. So we're going to go Ezekiel chapter 44. We're going to start reading about a different set of people, not the elect in verse 12. Then we'll get to the elect after that. So we're going to go Ezekiel chapter 44. Picking it up in verse 12, and it reads, and like I said, this is not talking about the elect yet. 
Ezekiel 44, verse 12. Because they ministered unto them before their idols and caused the house of Israel to fall into iniquity. Therefore have I lifted up my hand against them, saith the Lord God, and they shall bear their iniquity. Verse 13. And they shall not come near unto me. This is our Heavenly Father speaking. To do the office of a priest unto me, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed, like following the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. 14. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. Now we come to the elect. Verse 15. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, Zadok means the righteous if you were to translate it, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God. So it is the elect that will be able to do that. And to offer the fat and the blood in the millennium, you know, that's symbolic. It's spiritual sacrifices that will be offered in the millennium. Your love, your, um, your obedience and service to God. All animal sacrifices done away with when Jesus Christ paid the price on the cross. But yes, those that we read in verse 12 through 14, that they fell away to the abominations, they cannot do what the elect have the privilege of doing in that verse. 16. They shall enter into my sanctuary, and once again, this is the heavenly Father speaking. And they shall come near to my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. 17. And it shall come to pass that when they enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed with linen garments, and no wool shall come upon them while they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. 18. They shall have linen bonnets upon their heads, and they shall have linen breeches upon their loins. They shall not gird themselves with anything that causes sweat. So, but now you're going to see in verse 19, they're, they're not just staying in that inner place the whole thousand years. They got work to do. Now, verse 19. And when they go forth into the utter court, even unto the utter court to the people, so they're going amongst other people here, they shall put off their garments wherein they minister, and lay them in the holy chambers, and they shall put on other garments, and they shall not sanctify the people with their garments. When they go around those other people, they're not wearing that sacred linen that they wear in the inner place. 20. Neither shall they shave their heads, nor suffer their locks to grow long. They shall only pull their heads, be clean. 11. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the court, enter into the inner court. Verse 22. Neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that is put away, but they shall take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or a widow that had a priest before. Now, of course, in the millennium, there is no giving and taking in marriage, but everything will be done correctly, according to God's way, according to purity. We are to be the bride of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and of course, that's spiritual. 23. This is what the elect are going to be doing in the millennium. Verse 23. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. 24. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes and all mine assemblies, and they shall hollow my Sabbaths. Now, you did mention Jesus Christ in your question. Turn over with me to Ezekiel chapter 46. Now, when you read about the prince in these millennium chapters, that prince is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you can make note of Ezekiel chapter 34, about verses 21 through 23. And Ezekiel chapter 37, about verses 21 through 23 or 24. So let's go to Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1. Thus saith the Lord God, The gate of the inner court that looketh toward the east shall be shut the six working days, but on the Sabbath it shall be opened, and in the day of the new moon it shall be opened. 
And never forget Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Verse 2. And the prince, this is our Savior Jesus Christ. And the prince shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate without, and shall stand by the post of the gate. And the priest, that's God's elect, or these priests, shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings. Once again, those symbolic for the millennium. No actual burnt offerings or peace offerings. Christ did away with that. And he shall worship at the threshold of the gate. Who's the Son, Jesus Christ, worshiping? Our Heavenly Father, of course. It is not until the third earth age, until the millennium is over, that the Father Himself will be with us, and it will be all in all. Like you see in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, about verse 23, somewhere around there. Then shall He go forth, but the gate shall not be shut until the evening. Verse 3, likewise the people of the land, so, so this is other people, shall worship at the door of this gate before the Lord in the Sabbaths and in the new moons. Now let's get down again to verse 8 of this same chapter. Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 8. And when the prince, that's Jesus Christ, shall enter, he shall go in by the way of the porch of that gate, and he shall go forth by the way thereof. Verse 9. But when the people of the land, once again, this isn't even talking about the elect here. This is talking about other people. When the people of the land shall come before the Lord, that's before Yahweh our Father, in the solemn feasts, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. So you go in one way, and then you keep going, go out the other way. You don't turn around and everyone get all bubbled up and unorganized. Continuing in verse 9. And he that entereth by the way of the south gate shall go forth by the way of the north gate. He shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against it. So other people will be doing this, but it is only the elect that get to go into the very inner portion that we read about in chapter 44. Verse 10 to complete. And the prince in the midst of them, that's Jesus Christ, right in the midst of them. When they go in, shall go in, and when they go forth, shall go forth. What an absolutely incredible time that that millennium is going to be. But the elect who have a job to do, teach right from wrong, and teach people what is right. Because you see, those that have not already received salvation when the millennium begins... They're spiritually dead for the thousand years, meaning their soul is still mortal. But it will be taught in the millennium. But it, Satan's locked away in the pit for the whole thousand years. And at the end of the thousand years, Satan's going to be let loose one last time. And then those who choose to follow Satan will die the second death with him. But those who choose to serve Jesus Christ will receive eternal life and live forever. And then we will go into that perfect eternity, that third earth age of Revelation chapter 21 and 22. Next question, we don't know this person's name. What is the fullness of the Gentile, and when will Israel's eyes be opened? Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Let's go ahead and read that verse. I have it written right here. This is Romans chapter 11, verse 25. It says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And you're reading about in um, Romans chapter 11 how in part there are many, not all, but there are many Israelites who are blinded, but through that salvation is come to the Gentiles. But you see, when, so when does the true, complete fullness come in? When Jesus Christ returns. That's when every knee will bow, every Israelite, every Gentile, the knee will bow to Jesus Christ. And then those who were not saved before that, they will be taught in that thousand years. But so it's saying, don't get boastful, and no one should be boastful, Israelite or Gentile. But so that's the main thing that Revelate, or that Romans chapter 11 is about. It's an absolutely beautiful chapter. Salvation is not only for Israel, it's, it's for all people. Any people, any race, 
to if you accept Jesus Christ, you receive eternal life and you will live forever. And with that, the time of the Gentiles, I might, even though it's, uh, I would just have to mention to you Luke chapter 21, verse 24, but there's a whole lot more being talked about in that Luke 21, but I could not help but mention it in connection to this. Stanley from Virginia. From the fourth chapter of Revelation until chapter 22, verse 16, there is no mention of the church, the ecclesia. Ecclesia is the Greek word for church. And yeah, that exact word ecclesia is not used in those chapters you mentioned, but the church is still mentioned. Let's continue your question. There are some 200 Old Testament terms used by John, and I'm not really sure why you said that, but okay. Could, could that mean the church is not around? Not trying to argue, just asking. And no, that doesn't mean that at all. Of course the church is around. And you read about the... I'm going to give three specific places that spells it out for you that the church is here in the tribulation. I could mention more. But when I know that people are taught this. It's such a lie. They say the church is never mentioned between Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation 22. Well, that's a lie. First of all, you have the 144,000 who are sealed in Revelation chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. What does it mean they're sealed? They have the seal of God in their forehead. You can't get that without believe, believing in Jesus Christ. You can't believe that without being a part of the church. So you have that there. Also, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. It says, And the dragon, you know, the dragon is Satan. It's just one of his names. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. So then speaking of when Satan is on earth as the false Christ. Revelation chapter 12 verse 17 says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Does that sound like they're gone? Of course not. If you keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, you're a part of the church. I mentioned one more, Revelation chapter 13 verse 7. And it was given unto him, and being Satan when he's here is the false Christ, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Saints are a part of the church, are not raptured away somewhere. And to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And Satan is going to take over the whole world. And yes, it will maybe seem to many like Satan's going to win, but of course he's not going to. That's made that's obvious anyway, but if you have any doubt, you can read Revelation 15. The saints will be persecuted. They will be hated. But you know that it's your destiny to stand against the false Christ and to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through you, as you see in Mark chapter 13. And what's crazy is, from things I've heard multiple people say, it's like that people are taught... That it, Apparently, this is obviously not true, but it seems like people are taught like no Israelites are Christians. I mean, how ridiculous is that when it was the, it was the Israelites that became Christians first? But it, it's like people are taught that no Israelites are Christians, and then what's even worse, it seems like people are taught that it's okay just to not be a Christian if you're an Israelite. Is that the dumbest thing you ever heard or what? If you're not with Christ, you're against Him. Whether you be Israelite or Gentile. But you see, people use that twisted theology and they say, oh no, Israel's going to be here, but the church is gone. When, how, do you not realize many Israelites are a part of the church? People twist God's word so bad because they're such cowards, they don't want to stand against the false Christ. They want to fly away in a pre tribulation rapture, which is one of the most wicked doctrines that had ever been taught. It's a lie. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, countless other places prove to you there's no such thing as a pre-tribulation rapture. The church is here, everyone's here, unless your flesh body died before that, of course. But so, and of course you will have the two witnesses that will be here as well, as well as Antipas. But so, don't get twisted away by men twisting the word of God to fit their own false doctrine. Our job is to stand against the false Messiah. Do not be deceived. That deception of Satan as the false Christ will happen first before we are gathered together to Jesus Christ. 
One more question. We don't know this person's name. What prophecies have not, and I want to say one thing real quick too. Um, you know, how is Satan going to deceive the world? How does he destroy? Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. He by peace shall destroy many. He's going to claim to be the God and Savior of all by the peace and the miracles that he's going to perform. Don't be deceived. All right, now that's, there's going to be, this kind of going to lead right into this question. The last one, the question, we don't know this person's name. What prophecies have not been fulfilled yet? How about Obadiah chapter 1, verse 20? Then you have in parentheses, southern Lebanon. But what's Obadiah about? It's about God's wrath, his vengeance coming down on Edom. And what do you see in verse 15? It mentions the day of the Lord. When is that? That's when the seventh trump sounds and God's wrath is poured out. The vials of Revelation chapter 16 are going to be poured out. So that doesn't happen in a... Did I say... And you said also, I mean before the sixth trump. So this person is saying, what prophecies have not been fulfilled um, before the sixth trump? And But see, the wrath that comes down on Edom that's written in Obadiah chapter 1, that's at, that's at the seventh trump. So that's, that's not, that of course has not already happened. That's not going to happen until the end of the reign of the false Christ when it's time for Jesus Christ to return. So, and of course everything is going to be set right as you see in that Obadiah chapter 1 verse 20 and as you see throughout that whole chapter. But, so you say, what prophecies have not yet been fulfilled? And of course, I mean, I can't imagine trying to pinpoint every single prophecy in the word of God. But um, but we we're, we sure try. But um, I'll mention this. I wanted to mention first of all, Second Peter chapter one verse twenty, where it says, "No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. God's word proves itself. Never try to change it. Stick to what the Word of God says. It proves itself." So, but I want to mention. Well, I'm going to go and read some verses in Matthew chapter twenty four. We're going to pick it up in Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. And what you, what you read in Matthew 24, certain parts, is very similar to what you read about the seals in um, Revelation chapter 6. And you have the, the seventh seal at the beginning of Revelation chapter 8. But these are things, truths, you have to have sealed in your forehead. That you have to have sealed in your mind. So let's go Matthew chapter 24. Verse 1, and it reads, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? That's the parousia that you also read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And of the end of the world. What's it going to be like at the end of this age? So, of course, it's talking about the future. The things that are going to happen at the very, very end. Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That's his very first warning here. Five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, that's a plague, an epidemic disease, and earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 8, All these are the beginning of sorrows. Check out that word sorrows in your Charles Concordance. It means labor pangs. Now to complete, turn with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Gonna have a fantastic connection to this. Gonna go Thessalonians, which you have um, Thessalonians right after Colossians, right before Timothy. 
We're going to go 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, picking it up, verse 1, and it reads, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. You're already supposed to know it. Why? Because you've studied God's word. Verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Mind you, we just mentioned in Obadiah. So when's that happen? The return of the true Christ. One more verse, verse 3. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, the labor pain. Same Greek word as in Matthew 24. And they shall not escape. So you see, when Satan's here is the false Christ, he brings peace to the world. Brings a message of love and salvation. Just worship me and I'll give you everything. Remember how he tried to tempt Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. But then, when that seventh trumpet sounds, those, those two witnesses rise up from the dead after they were killed three and a half days later. God's wrath is going to be poured out. And many people are going to wish for mountains to fall on them. Like you see in Revelation chapter 6, verses about 16 in the following verses. So keep those seals in your mind. And of course, to know what happens before the sixth trumpet, read what happens in the first five trumpets will be a good start. But So that deception is coming. Um, I wanted to mention one more thing. I will mention the raiser of taxes, Daniel chapter 11. This is what Daniel chapter 11, verses 20 through 21 says. Then shall stand up in his estate a raiser of taxes in the glory of the kingdom. But within few days he shall be destroyed, neither in anger nor in battle. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person, to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. I mean, Satan is going to arrive as the false messiah. You read, it says that Satan in Ezekiel chapter 28, about verse 12, it says he's full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He's going to be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. Study God's word. Be ready. You know your job is standing against him. And you know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through 52, that when Jesus, when the seventh trumpet sounds and it's time for Jesus Christ to return, every single person is changed into a spiritual body. So you know if you're still in the flesh, Jesus Christ has not returned. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yeah, the Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word in this place you've given us so we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us always with your Holy Spirit as we continue to study your word. We ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you for blessing us so much, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.